GR number 127882 December 1, 2004. LA Bugilblum Tribal Association Inc. Represented by its chairman Flong Miguel M. Lumong, Wigbato E. Tanada, Poncian Obenagan, Jaime Tadio, Renato R. Constantino Jr., Flong Agustin M. Deby, Roberto P. M. Loy, Ricom L. Deby, Simeon H. Tolojo, Amelda M. Gandon, Lenny B. Guzanan, Marcello L. Guzanan, Quintal A. Labuayan, Lomingas D. Loway, Benita P. Takuayan, Miners Jolie L. Bgoy. Represented by his father Undero Deep Guayan Roger M. Dating, represented by his father Antonio L. Dating, Rami A. Lagaro, represented by his father Toting A. Lagaro, Mikanate John B. Lumong, represented by his father Miguel M. Lumong, Rene T. Miguel, represented by his mother Edith T. Miguel, Aldemar L. Sal, represented by his father Danny M. Sal, Daisy Ricars, represented by her mother Lydia Santos. Edward M. M. E. Alan P. Mamperer, Mario L. Mankult, Alden S. Dusen, Amparo S. Yap, Virgilio Cooler, Marvic M. B. F. Leonin, Julia Regina Cooler, Giancarlo Cooler, Virgilio Cooler Jr., represented by their father Virgilio Cooler, Paul Antonio P. Villamer, represented by his parents Jose Villamer and Elizabeth Pua Villamer, Anna Ginina Artalgia. Represented by her father Mario Jose B. Talgia, Charmaine R. Cunanan, represented by her father Alfredo M. Cunanan, Antonio Jose A. Vitug III, represented by his mother Anna Isa A. Vitug, Lean D. Narvadez, represented by his father Manuel E. Narvadez Jr., Rosario Merrill I. Lingating, represented by her father Rio Olimpio A. Lingating, Mario Jose B. Talgia, David E. Devira, Maria Mila Grosel Sanjos, A, Senior Susan O. Bolanio, O, N, D, Lolita G. D. Montavard, Benji L. Nequinto, Juan Rose Lilias Romano, Roberto S. Verzla, Eduardo Aurelio C. Reyes, Lean Lule Peria, represented by his father Raul Pidio V. Peria, 2 Green Forum Philippines, Green Forum Western Visa IS, G. F. W. V., Environmental Legal Assistance Center. ELAC, Xantango Sakon Laran and G. Can Yunan at Rapamang Panskahan, Xan, Three Partnership for Agrarian Reform and Rural Development Services Inc., PADS, Philippine Partnership for the Development of Human Resources in the Rural Areas Inc., Fildra, Women's Legal Bureau, WLB, Center for Alternative Development Initiatives Inc., CADI, Upland Development Institute, UDI. In Ayahan Foundation Inc., Centro NG Alternatibong Lingap Panlegal, Saligan, and Legal Rights and Natural Resources Center Inc., LRC, Petitioners. Versus. Victor O. Ramos, Secretary, Department of Environment and Natural Resources, DENR, Horacio Ramos, Director, Mines and Geosciences Bureau, MGB Dan Ruben Torres, Executive Secretary, and WMC, Philippines, Inc., for respondents. R. E. S. O. L. U. T. I. O. N. Panganiban, J. All mineral resources are owned by the state. Their exploration, development and utilization, EDU, must always be subject to the full controlling supervision of the state. More specifically, given the inadequacy of Filipino capital and technology in large-scale EDU activities, the state may secure the help of foreign companies in all relevant matters, especially financial and technical assistance, provided that, at all times, the state maintains its right of full control. The foreign assister or contractor assumes all financial, technical and entrepreneurial risks in the EDU activities, hence, it may be given reasonable management, operational, marketing, audit and other prerogatives to protect its investments and to enable the business to succeed. Full control is not an athematic to day-to-day -day management by the contractor, provided that the state retains the power to direct overall strategy, and to set aside, reverse or modify plans and actions of the contractor. The idea of full control is similar to that which is exercised by the board of directors of a private corporation, the performance of managerial, operational, financial, marketing and other functions may be delegated to subordinate officers or given to contractual entities, but the board retains full residual control of the business. 
who or what organ of government actually exercises this power of control on behalf of the state. The Constitution is crystal clear, the President. Indeed, the Chief Executive is the official constitutionally mandated to enter into agreements with foreign-owned corporations. On the other hand, Congress may review the action of the President once it is notified of every contract entered into in accordance with this constitutional provision within 30 days from its execution. In contrast to this express mandate of the President and Congress in the Edu of Natural Resources, Article 12 of the Constitution is silent on the role of the judiciary. However, should the President and or Congress gravely abuse their discretion in this regard, the courts may, in a proper case, exercise their residual duty under Article 8. Clearly then, the judiciary should not inordinately interfere in the exercise of this presidential power of control over the edu of our natural resources. The Constitution should be read in broad, life-giving strokes. It should not be used to strangulate economic growth or to serve narrow, parochial interests. Rather, it should be construed to grant the President and Congress sufficient discretion and reasonable leeway to enable them to attract foreign investments and expertise, as well as to secure for our people and our posterity the blessings of prosperity and peace. On the basis of this control standard, this Court upholds the constitutionality of the Philippine Mining Law, its implementing rules and regulations, insofar as they relate to financial and technical agreements, as well as the Subject Financial and Technical Assistance Agreement, FTA. 5. Background The petition for prohibition and mandamus before the Court challenges the constitutionality of 1. Republic Act No. Ra. 7942, the Philippine Mining Act of 1995, 2. Its implementing rules and regulations, then Administrative Order No. Dow 9640, and 3. The FTA dated March 30, 1995, 6 executed by the government with Western Mining Corporation, Philippines, Inc., WMCP. 7. On January 27, 2004, the court and bank promulgated its decision 8 granting the petition and declaring the unconstitutionality of certain provisions of RAW 7942, down 9640, as well as of the entire FTA executed between the government and WMCP, mainly on the finding that FTAs are service contracts prohibited by the 1987 Constitution. The decision struck down the subject FTA for being similar to service contracts. 9 which, though permitted under the 1973 Constitution, 10 were subsequently denounced for being antithetical to the principle of sovereignty over our natural resources, because they allowed foreign control over the exploitation of our natural resources, to the prejudice of the Filipino nation. The decision quoted several legal scholars and authors who had criticized service contracts for, inter alia, vesting in the foreign contractor exclusive management and control of the enterprise, including operation of the field in the event petroleum was discovered, control of production, expansion and development, nearly unfettered control over the disposition and sale of the products discovered slash extracted, effective ownership of the natural resource at the point of extraction and beneficial ownership of our economic resources. According to the decision, the 1987 Constitution, Section 2 of Article 12, effectively banned such service contracts. Subsequently, respondents filed separate motions for reconsideration. In a resolution dated March 9, 2004, the court required petitioners to comment thereon. In the resolution of June 8, 2004, it set the case for oral argument on June 29, 2004. After hearing the opposing sides, the court required the parties to submit their respective memoranda in amplification of their arguments. In a resolution issued later the same day, June 29, 2004, the court noted, inter alia, the manifestation and motion, in lieu of comment, filed by the Office of the Solicitor General, OSG on behalf of public respondents. The OSG said that it was not interposing any objection to the motion for intervention filed by the Chamber of Mines of the Philippines Inc. CMP, and was in fact joining and adopting the latter's motion for reconsideration. 
memoranda were accordingly filed by the intervener as well as by petitioners, public respondents, and private respondent, dwelling at length on the three issues discussed below. Later, WMCP submitted its reply memorandum, while the OSG, in obedience to an order of this court, filed a compliance submitting copies of MORFTIS entered into by the government. Three issues identified by the court. During the oral argument, the court identified the three issues to be resolved in the present controversy, as follows. 1. Has the case been rendered moot by the sale of WMC shares in WMCP2 Sagittarius? 60% of Sagittarius equity is owned by Filipinos and or Filipino-owned corporations while 40% is owned by Intifil Resources NL, an Australian company, and by the subsequent transfer and registration of the FTA from WMCP to Sagittarius. 2. Assuming that the case has been rendered moot, would it still be proper to resolve the constitutionality of the assailed provisions of the mining law, Dow 9640 and the WMC PIFTA? 3. What is the proper interpretation of the phrase agreements involving either technical or financial assistance contained in paragraph 4 of section 2 of article 12 of the Constitution? Should the motion for reconsideration be granted? Respondents and interveners' motions for reconsideration should be granted for the reasons discussed below. The foregoing three issues identified by the court shall now be taken up seriatim. First issue. Mootness. In declaring unconstitutional certain provisions of RA 7942, down 9640, and the WMC PIFTA, the majority decision agreed with petitioner's contention that the subject FTA had been executed in violation of Section 2 of Article 12 of the 1987 Constitution. According to petitioners, the FTAs entered into by the government with four known corporations are limited by the fourth paragraph of the said provision to agreements involving only technical or financial assistance for large-scale exploration, development and utilization of minerals, petroleum and other mineral oils. Furthermore, the foreign contractor is allegedly permitted by the FTA in question to fully manage and control the mining operations and, therefore, to acquire beneficial ownership of our mineral resources. The decision merely shrugged off the manifestation by WMPC informing the court, 1, that on January 23, 2001, WMC had sold all its shares in WMCP to Sagittarius Mines Incorporated, 60% of whose equity was held by Filipinos, and, 2, that the assailed FTA had likewise been transferred from WMCP to Sagittarius. Eleven opponents had declared that the instant case had not been rendered moot by the transfer and registration of the FTA to a Filipino-owned corporation, and that the validity of the said transfer remained in dispute and awaited final judicial determination. Twelve patently therefore, the decision is anchored on the assumption that WMCP had remained a foreign corporation. The crux of this issue of mootness is the fact that WMCP, at the time it entered into the FTA, happened to be wholly owned by WMC Resources International Proprietary, Limited, WMC, which in turn was a wholly owned subsidiary of Western Mining Corporation Holdings Limited, a publicly listed major Australian mining and exploration company. The nullity of the FTA was obviously premised upon the contractor being a foreign corporation. Had the FTA been originally issued to a Filipino-owned corporation, there would have been no constitutionality issue to speak of. Upon the other hand, the conveyance of the WMCP FTA to a Filipino corporation can be likened to the sale of land to a foreigner who subsequently acquires Filipino citizenship, or who later resells the same land to a Filipino citizen. The conveyance would be validated as the property in question would no longer be owned by a disqualified vendee. And, inasmuch as the FTA is to be implemented now by a Filipino corporation, it is no longer possible for the court to declare it is unconstitutional. The case pending in the Court of Appeals is a dispute between two Filipino companies, Sagittarius and Naponto, both claiming the right to purchase the foreign shares in WMCP. So, regardless of which side eventually wins, the FTA would still be in the hands of a qualified Filipino company.
considering that there is no longer any justiciable controversy, the plea to nullify the mining law has become a virtual petition for declaratory relief, over which this court has no original jurisdiction. In their final memorandum, however, petitioners argue that the case has not become moot, considering the invalidity of the alleged sale of the shares in WMCP from WMC to Sagittarius, and of the transfer of the FTA from WMCP to Sagittarius, resulting in the change of contractor in the FTA in question. And even assuming that the said transfers were valid, there still exists an actual case predicated on the invalidity of RAW 7942 and its implementing rules and regulations, down 9640. Presently, we shall discuss petitioners' objections to the transfer of both the shares and the FTA. We shall take up the alleged invalidity of RAW 7942 and down 9640 later on in the discussion of the third issue. No transgression of the Constitution. By the transfer of the WMCP shares. Petitioners claim, first, that the alleged invalidity of the transfer of the WMCP shares to Sagittarius violates the fourth paragraph of Section 2 of Article 12 of the Constitution. Second, that it is contrary to the provisions of the WMCP FTA itself, and third, that the sale of the shares is suspect and should therefore be the subject of a case in which its validity may properly be litigated. On the first ground, petitioners assert that paragraph 4 of section 2 of article 12 permits the government to enter into FTAs only with foreign owned corporations. Petitioners insist that the first paragraph of this constitutional provision limits the participation of Filipino corporations in the exploration, development and utilization of natural resources to only three species of contracts, production sharing, co-production and joint venture, to the exclusion of all other arrangements or variations thereof, and the WMCP time may therefore not be validly assumed and implemented by Sagittarius. In short, Petitioners claim that a Filipino corporation is not allowed by the Constitution to enter into an FTA with the government. However, a textual analysis of the first paragraph of Section 2 of Article 12 does not support petitioners' argument. The pertinent part of the said provision states, Sec. 2. XXX The exploration, development and utilization of natural resources shall be under the full control and supervision of the state. The state may directly undertake such activities, or it may enter into co-production, joint venture, or production sharing agreements with Filipino citizens, or corporations or associations at least 60% of whose capital is owned by such citizens. XXX. Nowhere in the provision is there any expressed limitation or restriction insofar as arrangements other than the three aforementioned contractual schemes are concerned. Neither can one reasonably discern any implied stricture to that effect. Besides, there is no basis to believe that the framers of the Constitution, a majority of whom were obviously concerned with furthering the development and utilization of the country's natural resources, could have wanted to restrict Filipino participation in that area. This point is clear, especially in the light of the overarching constitutional principle of giving preference and priority to Filipinos and Filipino corporations in the development of our natural resources. Besides, even assuming, purely for argument's sake, that a constitutional limitation barring Filipino corporations from holding and implementing and to actually exists, nevertheless, such provision would apply only to the transfer of the FTA to Sagittarius, but definitely not to the sale of WMC's equity stake in WMCP2 Sagittarius. Otherwise, an unreasonable curtailment of property rights without due process of law would ensue. Petitioner's argument must therefore fail. The not intended. Solely for foreign corporation. Equally barren of merit is the second ground cited by petitioners, that the FTA was intended to apply solely to a foreign corporation as can allegedly be seen from the provisions therein. They managed to cite only one WMCP FTA provision that can be regarded as clearly intended to apply only to a foreign contractor, Section 12, which provides for international commercial arbitration under the auspices of the International Chamber of Commerce, after local remedies are exhausted. This provision, however, 
does not necessarily imply that the WMC PIFTA cannot be transferred to and assumed by a Filipino corporation like Sagittarius, in which event the said provision should simply be disregarding as a superfluity. No need for a separate litigation of the sale of shares. Petitioners claim as third ground the suspicious sale of shares from WMC to Sagittarius, hence, the need to litigate it in a separate case. Section 40 of Raw 7942, the mining law, allegedly requires the President's prior approval of a transfer. A rereading of the said provision, however, leads to a different conclusion. Sec. 40. Assignment, transfer, a financial or technical assistance agreement may be assigned or transferred, in whole or in part, to a qualified person subject to the prior approval of the President, provided, that the President shall notify Congress of every financial or technical assistance agreement assigned or converted in accordance with this provision within 30, 30, days from the date of the approval thereof. Section 40 expressly applies to the assignment or transfer of the FTA, not to the sale and transfer of shares of stock in WMCP. Moreover, when the transferee of an FTA is another foreign corporation, there is a logical application of the requirement of prior approval by the President of the Republic and notification to Congress in the event of assignment or transfer of an FTA. In this situation, such approval and notification are appropriate safeguards, considering that the new contractor is the subject of a foreign government. On the other hand, when the transferee of the FTA happens to be a Filipino corporation, the need for such safeguard is not critical, hence, the lack of prior approval and notification may not be deemed fatal as to render the transfer invalid. Besides, it is not as if approval by the President is entirely absent in this instance. As pointed out by private respondent in its memorandum, 13 The issue of approval is the subject of one of the cases brought by Lepanto against Sagittarius in GR No. 162331. That case involved the review of the decision of the Court of Appeals dated November 21, 2003 NCA GRSP No. 74161 which affirmed the Denver order dated December 31, 2001 and the decision of the Office of the President dated July 23, 2002, both approving the assignment of the WMC PIFTA to Sagittarius. Petitioners also questioned the sale price and the financial capacity of the transferee. According to the deed of absolute sale dated January 23, 2001, executed between WMC and Sagittarius, the price of the WMCP shares was fixed at US$9,875,000, equivalent to P553 million at an exchange rate of 56 to 1. Sagittarius had an authorized capital stock of P250 million and a paid up capital of P60 million. Therefore, at the time of approval of the sale by the DEN, the debt to equity ratio of the transferee was over 9 to 1 hardly ideal for an FTA contractor, according to petitioners. However, private respondents counter that the deed of sale specifically provides that the payment of the purchase price would take place only after Sagittarius commencement of commercial production from mining operations, if at all. Consequently, under the circumstances, we believe it would not be reasonable to conclude, as petitioners did that the transferee's high debt-to-equity ratio per se necessarily carried negative implications for the enterprise, and it would certainly be improper to invalidate the sale on that basis, as petitioners propose. The not void? Thus transferable. To bolster further their claim that the case is not moot, petitioners insist that the FTAP is void and, hence cannot be transferred, and that its transfer does not operate to cure the constitutional infirmity that is inherent in it, neither will a change in the circumstances of one of the parties serve to ratify the void contract. While the discussion in their final memorandum was skimpy, petitioners and their comment, on the Mr. Did ratiocinate that this court had declared the FTA to be void because, at the time it was executed with WMCP, the latter was a fully foreign-owned corporation, in which the former vested full control and management with respect to the exploration, development and utilization of mineral resources, contrary to the provisions of paragraph 4 of section 2 of article 12 of the Constitution.
and since the FTA was per se void, no valid right could be transferred, neither could it be ratified, so petitioners conclude. Petitioners have assumed as the fact that which has yet to be established. First and foremost, the decision of this court declaring the FTA void has not yet become final. That was precisely the reason the court still heard oral argument in this case. Second, the FTA does not vest in the foreign corporation full control and supervision over the exploration, development and utilization of mineral resources, to the exclusion of the government. This point will be dealt with in greater detail below, but for now, suffice it to say that a perusal of the FTA provisions will prove that the government has effective overall direction and control of the mining operations, including marketing and product pricing, and that the contractor's work programs and budgets are subject to its review and approval or disapproval. As will be detailed later on, the government does not have to micromanage the mining operations and dip its hands into the day-to-day -day management of the enterprise in order to be considered as having overall control and direction. Besides, for practical and pragmatic reasons, there is a need for government agencies to delegate certain aspects of the management work to the contractor. Thus the basis for declaring the FTA void still has to be revisited, re-examined and reconsidered. Petitioners sniff at the citation of Chavez v. Public Estates Authority, 14 and Halili v. C.A., 15 claiming that the doctrines in these cases are wholly inapplicable to the instant case. Chavez clearly teaches, thus, the court has ruled consistently that where a Filipino citizen sells land to an alien who later sells the land to a Filipino, the invalidity of the first transfer is corrected by the subsequent sale to a citizen. Similarly, where the alien who buys the land subsequently acquires Philippine citizenship, the sale is validated since the purpose of the constitutional ban to limit land ownership to Filipinos has been achieved. In short, the law disregards the constitutional disqualification of the buyer to hold land if the land is subsequently transferred to a qualified party, or the buyer himself becomes a qualified party. 16. In their comment. Petitioners contend that in Chavez and Halili, the object of the transfer, the land, was not what was assailed for alleged unconstitutionality. Rather, it was the transaction that was assailed, hence subsequent compliance with constitutional provisions would cure its infirmity. In contrast, in the instant case it is the FTA itself, the object of the transfer, that is being assailed as invalid and unconstitutional. So, petitioners claim that the subsequent transfer of a void FTA to a Filipino corporation would not cure the defect. Petitioners are confusing themselves. The present petition has been filed, precisely because the grantee of the FTA was a wholly owned subsidiary of a foreign corporation. It cannot be gainsaid that anyone would have asserted that the same FTA was void if it had at the outset been issued to a Filipino corporation. The FTA, therefore, is not per se defective or unconstitutional. It was questioned only because it had been issued to an allegedly non-qualified, foreign-owned corporation. We believe that this case is clearly analogous to Halili, in which the land acquired by a non-Filipino was reconveyed to a qualified vendee and the original transaction was thereby cured. Paraphrasing Halili, the same rationale applies to the instant case. Assuming arguendo the invalidity of its prior grant to a foreign corporation, the disputed FTA, being now held by a Filipino corporation, can no longer be assailed. The objective of the constitutional provision, to keep the exploration, development and utilization of our natural resources in Filipino hands, has been served. More accurately speaking, the present situation is one degree better than that obtaining in Halili, in which the original sale to a non-Filipino was clearly and indisputably violative of the constitutional prohibition and thus void ab initio. In the present case, the issuance, grant of the subject threat to the then foreign-owned WMCP was not illegal, void or unconstitutional at the time. The matter had to be brought to court precisely for adjudication as to whether the FTA and the mining law had indeed violated the Constitution. Since, up to this point, the decision of this court declaring the FTA void has yet to become final, to all intents and purposes, the FTA must be deemed valid in Constitutional.17. At bottom, we find completely outlandish petitioner's contention that an FTA could be entered into by the government only with a foreign corporation, 
never with the Filipino enterprise. Indeed, the nationalistic provisions of the Constitution are all anchored on the protection of Filipino interests. How petitioners can now argue that foreigners have the exclusive right to thus totally overturns the entire basis of the petition, preference for the Filipino in the exploration, development and utilization of our natural resources. It does not take deep knowledge of law and logic to understand that what the Constitution grants to foreigners should be equally available to Filipinos. Second issue. Whether the court can still decide the case. Even assuming it is moot. All the protagonists are in agreement that the court has jurisdiction to decide this controversy, even assuming it to be moot. Petitioners stress the following points. First, while a case becomes moot and academic when there is no more actual controversy between the parties or no useful purpose can be served in passing upon the merits, 18 what is at issue in the instant case is not only the validity of the WMC PIFTA, but also the constitutionality of RAW 7942 and its implementing rules and regulations. Second, the acts of private respondent cannot operate to cure the law of its alleged unconstitutionality or to divest this court of its jurisdiction to decide. Third, the Constitution imposes upon the Supreme Court the duty to declare invalid any law that offends the Constitution. Petitioners also argue that no amendatory laws have been passed to make the Mining Act of 1995 conform to constitutional strictures, assuming that, at present, it does not, that public respondents will continue to implement and enforce the statute until this court rules otherwise, and that the said law continues to be the source of legal authority in accepting, processing and approving numerous applications for mining rights. Indeed, it appears that as of June 30, 2002, some 43 FTA applications had been filed with the Mines and Geosciences Bureau, MGB, with an aggregate area of 2,064,908.65 hectares, spread over Luzon, the Visayas and Mindanao 19, applied for. It may be a bit far-fetched to assert, as petitioners do, that each and every FTA that was entered into under the provisions of the Mining Act invites potential litigation for as long as the constitutional issues are not resolved with finality. Nevertheless, we must concede that there exists the distinct possibility that one or more of the future FTAs will be the subject of yet another suit grounded on constitutional issues. But of equal if not greater significance is the cloud of uncertainty hanging over the mining industry, which is even now scaring away foreign investments. Attesting to this climate of anxiety is the fact that the Chamber of Mines of the Philippines saw the urgent need to intervene in the case and to present its position during the oral argument, and that Secretary General Romulo Neri of the National Economic Development Authority NEDA, requested this court to allow him to speak, during that oral argument, on the economic consequences of the decision of January 27, 2004.20. We are convinced. We now agree that the court must recognize the exceptional character of the situation and the paramount public interest involved, as well as the necessity for a ruling to put an end to the uncertainties plaguing the mining industry and the affected communities as a result of doubts cast upon the constitutionality and validity of the Mining Act, the subject FTA and future FTAs, and the need to avert a multiplicity of suits. Paraphrasing Gonzales v. Commission on Elections, 21 It is evident that strong reasons of public policy demand that the constitutionality issue be resolved now. 22. In further support of the immediate resolution of the constitutionality issue, public respondents cite a cop v. King Ona, 23 to the effect that the courts will decide a question, otherwise moot and academic, if it is capable of repetition, yet evading review. 24 public respondents ask the court to avoid a situation in which the constitutionality issue may again arise with respect to another FTA, the resolution of which may not be achieved until after it has become too late for our mining industry to grow out of its infancy. They also recall Salonga v. Cruz Panel, 25 in which this court declared that, Tihi Court also has the duty to formulate guiding and controlling constitutional principles, precepts, doctrines or rules.
It has the symbolic function of educating the bench and bar on the extent of protection given by constitutional guarantees. XXX. The mootness of the case in relation to the WMC beef to led the undersigned Bone Nandy to state in his dissent to the decision that there was no more justiciable controversy and the plea to nullify the mining law has become a virtual petition for declaratory relief. 26 The entry of the Chamber of Mines of the Philippines, Inc., however, has put into focus the seriousness of the allegations of unconstitutionality of RA 7942 and DAO 9640 which converts the case to one for Prohibition 27 in the enforcement of the said law and regulations. Indeed, this CMP entry brings to fore that the real issue in this case is whether paragraph 4 of section 2 of article 12 of the Constitution is contravened by RA 7942 and DAO 9640 not whether it was violated by specific acts implementing RA 7942 and DAO 9640. W. Hannon Act of the Legislative Department is seriously alleged to have infringed the Constitution, settling the controversy becomes the duty of this Court. By the mere enactment of the question law or the approval of the challenged action, the dispute is said to have ripened into a judicial controversy even without any other overt act. 28 This ruling can be traced from Tanada v. Angara, 29 in which the court said, In seeking to nullify an act of the Philippine Senate on the ground that it contravenes the Constitution, the petition no doubt raises a justiciable controversy. Where an action of the legislative branch is seriously alleged to have infringed the Constitution, it becomes not only the right but in fact the duty of the judiciary to settle the dispute. X, 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 X. As this court has repeatedly and firmly emphasized in many cases, it will not shirk, digress from or abandon its sacred duty and authority to uphold the Constitution in matters that involve grave abuse of discretion brought before it in appropriate cases, committed by any officer, agency, instrumentality or department of the government. 30. Additionally, the entry of CMP into this case has also effectively forestalled any possible objections arising from the standing or legal interest of the original parties. For all the foregoing reasons, we believe that the court should proceed to a resolution of the constitutional issues in this case. Third issue. The proper interpretation of the constitutional phrase. Agreements involving either technical or financial assistance. The constitutional provision at the nucleus of the controversy is paragraph 4 of section 2 of article 12 of the 1987 Constitution. In order to appreciate its context, section 2 was reproduced in full. Sec. 2. All lands of the public domain, waters, minerals, coal, petroleum, and other mineral oils, all forces of potential energy, fisheries, forests or timber, wildlife, flora and fauna, and other natural resources are owned by the state. With the exception of agricultural lands, all other natural resources shall not be alienated. The exploration, development and utilization of natural resources shall be under the full control and supervision of the state. The state may directly undertake such activities, or it may enter into co-production, joint venture or production sharing agreements with Filipino citizens or corporations or associations at least 60% of whose capital is owned by such citizens. Such agreements may be for a period not exceeding 25 years, renewable for not more than 25 years, and under such terms and conditions as may be provided by law. In cases of water rights for irrigation, water supply, fisheries, or industrial uses other than the development of water power, beneficial use may be the measure and limit of the grant. The state shall protect the nation's marine wealth in its archipelago waters, territorial sea, and exclusive economic zone, and reserve its use and enjoyment exclusively to Filipino citizens. The Congress may, by law, allow small-scale utilization of natural resources by Filipino citizens, as well as cooperative fish farming with priority to subsistence fishermen and fish workers in rivers, lakes, bays and lagoons. The President may enter into agreements with foreign-owned corporations involving either technical or financial assistance for a large-scale exploration, development, and utilization of minerals, 
petroleum, and other mineral oils according to the general terms and conditions provided by law, based on real contributions to the economic growth and general welfare of the country. In such agreements, the state shall promote the development and use of local scientific and technical resources. The President shall notify the Congress of every contract entered into in accordance with this provision, within 30 days from its execution. 31. No restriction of meaning by a verbal legis interpretation. To interpret the foregoing provision, petitioners adamantly assert that the language of the Constitution should prevail, that the primary method of interpreting it is to seek the ordinary meaning of the words used in its provisions. They rely on rulings of this court, such as the following. The fundamental principle in constitutional construction however is that the primary source from which to ascertain constitutional intent or purpose is the language of the provision itself. The presumption is that the words in which the constitutional provisions are couched express the objective sought to be attained. In other words, verbal legis prevails. Only when the meaning of the words used is unclear and equivocal should resort be made to extraneous aids of construction and interpretation, such as the proceedings of the Constitutional Commission or Convention to shed light on an ascertained the true intent or purpose of the provision being construed. 32. Very recently, in Francisco v. The House of Representatives, 33 the court indeed had the occasion to reiterate the well-settled principles of constitutional construction. First, verba legis, that is, wherever possible, the words used in the Constitution must be given their ordinary meaning except where technical terms are employed. XXX XXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXXX
This restrictive interpretation, petitioners believe, is in line with the general policy enunciated by the Constitution reserving to Filipino citizens and corporations the use and enjoyment of the country's natural resources. They maintain that this court's decision 36 of January 27, 2004 correctly declared the WMC PIFTA, along with pertinent provisions of RA 7942, void for allowing a foreign contractor to have direct and exclusive management of a mining enterprise. Allowing such a privilege not only runs counter to the full control and supervision that the state is constitutionally mandated to exercise over the exploration, development and utilization of the country's natural resources, doing so also vests in the foreign company beneficial ownership of our mineral resources. It will be recalled that the decision of January 27, 2004 zeroed in on management or other forms of assistance or other activities associated with the service contracts of the martial law regime, since the management or operation of mining activities by foreign contractors, which is the primary feature of service contracts, was precisely the evil that the drafters of the 1987 constitution sought to eradicate. On the other hand, the intervener 37 and public respondents argue that the FTA allowed by paragraph 4 is not merely an agreement for supplying limited and specific financial or technical services to the state. Rather, such FTA is a comprehensive agreement for the foreign-owned corporation's integrated exploration, development and utilization of mineral, petroleum or other mineral oils on a large-scale basis. The agreement, therefore, authorizes the foreign contractor's rendition of a whole range of integrated and comprehensive services, ranging from the discovery to the development, utilization and production of minerals or petroleum products. We do not see how applying a strictly literal or verbalegus interpretation of paragraph 4 could inexorably lead to the conclusions arrived at in the Ponin Sha. First, the drafter's choice of words. The use of the phrase agreements XXX involving either technical or financial assistance, does not indicate the intent to exclude other modes of assistance. The drafters opted to use involving when they could have simply said agreements for financial or technical assistance, if that was their intention to begin with. In this case, the limitation would be very clear and no further debate would ensue. In contrast, the use of the word involving signifies the possibility of the inclusion of other forms of assistance or activities having to do with, otherwise related to or compatible with financial or technical assistance. The word involving as used in this context has three connotations that can be differentiated thus. 1. The sense of concerning, having to do with, or affecting. 2. Entailing, requiring, implying or necessitating. And 3. Including, containing or comprising. 38. Plainly, none of the three connotations convey a sense of exclusivity. Moreover, the word involving, when understood in the sense of including, as an including technical or financial assistance, necessarily implies that there are activities other than those that are being included. In other words, if an agreement includes technical or financial assistance, there is apart from such assistance, something else already in, and covered or may be covered by, the said agreement. In short, it allows for the possibility that matters, other than those explicitly mentioned, could be made part of the agreement. Thus, we are now led to the conclusion that the use of the word involving implies that these agreements with foreign corporations are not limited to mere financial or technical assistance. The difference in sense becomes very apparent when we juxtapose agreements for technical or financial assistance against agreements including technical or financial assistance. This much is unalterably clear in a verbalegus approach. Second, if the real intention of the drafters was to confine foreign corporations to financial or technical assistance and nothing more, their language would have certainly been so unmistakably restrictive and stringent as to leave no doubt in anyone's mind about their true intent. For example, they would have used the sentence foreign corporations are absolutely prohibited from involvement in the management or operation of mining or similar ventures or words of similar import. A search for such stringent wording yields negative results. Thus, we come to the inevitable conclusion that there was a conscious and deliberate decision to avoid the use of restrictive wording that bespeaks an intent not to use the expression agreements XXX involving either technical or financial assistance in an exclusionary and limiting manner.
deletion of service contracts to avoid pitfalls of previous constitutions. Not to ban service contracts per se. Third, we do not see how a verbalegus approach leads to the conclusion that the management or operation of mining activities by foreign contractors, which is the primary feature of service contracts, was precisely the evil that the drafters of the 1987 Constitution sought to eradicate. Nowhere in the above quoted section can be discerned the objective to keep out of foreign hands the management or operation of mining activities or the plan to eradicate service contracts as these were understood in the 1973 Constitution. Still, petitioners maintain that the deletion or omission from the 1987 Constitution of the term service contracts found in the 1973 Constitution sufficiently proves the drafters' intent to exclude foreigners from the management of the affected enterprises. To our mind, however, such intent cannot be definitively and conclusively established from the mere failure to carry the same expression or term over to the new Constitution, absent more specific explicit and unequivocal statement to that effect. What petitioners seek, a complete ban on foreign participation in the management of mining operations, as previously allowed by the earlier constitutions, is nothing short of bringing about momentous sea change in the economic and developmental policies, and the fundamentally capitalist, free enterprise philosophy of our government. We cannot imagine such a radical shift being undertaken by our government, to the great prejudice of the mining sector in particular and our economy in general, merely on the basis of the omission of the term service contract from or the failure to carry them over to the new constitution. There has to be a much more definite and even unarguable basis for such a drastic reversal of policies. Fourth, a literal and restrictive interpretation of paragraph 4, such as that proposed by petitioners suffers from certain internal logical inconsistencies that generate ambiguities in the understanding of the provision. As the intervener pointed out, there has never been any constitutional or statutory provision that reserved to Filipino citizens or corporations, at least 60% of which is Filipino-owned, the rendition of financial or technical assistance to companies engaged in mining or the development of any other natural resource. The taking out of foreign currency or peso denominated loans or any other kind of financial assistance, as well as the rendition of technical assistance, whether to the state or to any other entity in the Philippines, has never been restricted in favor of Filipino citizens or corporations having a certain minimum percentage of Filipino equity. Such a restriction would certainly be preposterous and unnecessary. As a matter of fact, financial, and even technical assistance, regardless of the nationality of its source, would be welcomed in the mining industry anytime with open arms, on account of the dearth of local capital and the need to continually update technological know-how and improve technical skills. There was therefore no need for a constitutional provision specifically allowing foreign-owned corporations to render financial or technical assistance whether in respect of mining or some other resource development or commercial activity in the Philippines. The last point needs to be emphasized, if merely financial or technical assistance agreements are allowed, there would be no need to limit them to large-scale mining operations, as there would be far greater need for them in the smaller-scale mining activities, and even in non-mining areas. Obviously, the provision in question was intended to refer to agreements other than those for mere financial or technical assistance. In like manner, there would be no need to require the President of the Republic to report to Congress, if only financial or technical assistance agreements are involved. Such agreements are in the nature of foreign loans that, pursuant to Section 20 of Article 39 of the 1987 Constitution, the President may contract or guarantee merely with the prior concurrence of the Monetary Board. In turn, the Board is required to report to Congress within 30 days from the end of every quarter of the calendar year, not 30 days after the agreement is entered into. And if paragraph 4 permits only agreements for loans and other forms of financial or technical assistance, what is the point of requiring that they be based on real contributions to the economic growth and general welfare of the country? For instance, how is one to measure and assess the real contributions to the economic growth and general welfare of the country that may ensue from a foreign currency loan agreement or a technical assistance agreement for, say, 
the refurbishing of an existing power generating plant for a mining operation somewhere in Mindanao. Such a criterion would make more sense when applied to a major business investment in a principal sector of the industry.